like I said, the work we were doing in grad school tended to be a little more conceptual, or that seemed to, that seemed to be my expectation anyway. And and so it was nice to just be working with materials. And um, uh, yeah, and then I then just sort of one led to another, and they became more complex and more detailed and um, bigger and more interesting locations to work with. And uh, you know, I guess 20 years later, I'm you know, still. <laughs> And I still have many more to in me, I think. Um, well, I use a variety of fabrics depending on, on where they're going. If they're indoors, I prefer to use something as light as possible because I like the way the air moves through them and the way they respond to the movement of air. And I like things that are nice and papery too, like crispy and, and crinkly as opposed to um, like really cloth-like nylon. I prefer um, something like Tyvek, which is um, a synthetic paper, or a nylon spinnaker, which they use in sail making. Uh, which has a, um, which is very crinkly and paper-like, um, and it to me it just looks even more surprisingly like flesh when it's when it's full of air and it's moving and with age the way they they wrinkle and and uh, take on a sort of a patina they become more flesh-like in a really weird way even though it's a very high-tech clinical kind of fabric. This is a model of a um, cloud piece that I'm planning to make, and I'm making, I'm building it up in plaster, and it's going to be as puffy and as cloud-like as I can make it, and then I'll add more rings to it, and it'll become much taller. So when I have the form in, in finished in plaster, then I can start making the, the pattern pieces onto that form, and I fit them onto the form, and then uh, when the pattern is is fitted to my satisfaction, then I, I can I can draw it out at this size, uh, and then I can blow it up. And I, I do that sometimes just manually by like gridding, and I go from like a one inch grid to five, ten inch, or whatever, so I can go any any size I want. And um, so I grid it up that way, or I can take it to a, like a photocopying place if it's not such a huge piece and and have it blown up that way electronically. And then it's ready to start rolling fabric out. And I roll out fabric and lay the pattern on that, like you would um, making a shirt or a dress or something. And I have all the, the darts and the points where it, pieces should meet up. I mean, as long as the pieces all fit together, then it's going to look exactly like the model. But I like there to be variation. And uh, so I think that's one thing that makes, makes my work different from commercial inflatables is that the hand is more visible in them, that, that you know the lines aren't so precise. They're, they're much more detailed too, so there's a lot more pieces. And you know, if, if I go crooked on a seam, then that might just add some character. So I decide when I'm sewing if that's going to be acceptable or if I need to re-sew that crooked bit. And then there's then there's some refining often at the end when I you know look at it and, and realize that some pieces didn't work quite right, then if they have a bump or something that they shouldn't have, then I can smooth them out later. I'm always trying to give people a really satisfying sculptural experience. Like, so that means for me then that, that, that they're going to find uh, some, something that's really engaging them physically as well as mentally. So the, that the, the two are, are activated at once. So I think the inflatables, while they really get people going 
physically. I mean, when they see them, they get big children, get really rambunctious, but not just children, everybody does. And they seem to want to you know, bounce off of them and touch them and, and hit them and poke them and see if they explode. And, you know, if they're out in public and, you know, and untended, they tend to have all that happen to them. You know, people will try to see if they blow up, if they puncture them and it never does happen. But um, so it, it, they, they elicit I mean, just the medium itself, that it's, that it's these balloons that are full of air and full of pressure um, kind of do something to people that, that, that you know, <laughs> excite them in a way, I think. Um, but I'm, I hope that, that, that there's another level to the work that, gets, that also gets their mind going in the same, in the same way that you know, is related to how the work um, um, relates to, to the space that it's in and the context, uh, the history maybe, um, uh, and the history of, 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 of art as well, I think is, is uh, quite um, present in my work. Um, you know, going back to the ancient sculptors who were interested in how, how they animate stone uh, or bronze, you know, how they bring it to life. And, and so I'm sort of taking on that literally and sort of improving it by making the things really move and breathe and, and um, so that's why I'm really interested in, in as much detail in the figures as I can get. Um, um, so I, th I think uh, you know, the notion of, of air and air being you know, ever present in, in my work is, has, a, has a spiritual element as well. and. And that is that while well, that air and spirit are the same word in, in Latin, right? So um, um, I, I, think, I think when people see the work and experience it and they experience that it breathes and they breathe as well, they, there's an empathy. And I think that, that connectedness is, is really important. Um, and people, people get that, I think. And, um, I'm getting ready for a studio visit with a couple of um, uh, collectors from Belgium and they saw my giants in, in, uh, in Belgium in the fall and they wanted to come to my studio in Toronto and, and, and see some more because they, then the reaction in their message to me was, we saw your giants, we stopped breathing because they were breathing for us and, and um, people find, it, find them moving and which is really, a, always surprising and and uh, delightful for me because you know because they are just balloons and yet people are moved by them I think the space has um, some interesting dynamics in terms of the way people encounter it the way I ex first experienced it and the shape of it and the height and everything and the light up above really draws you in and and I think the bug will definitely interrupt the space and because of its size, uh, it will pretty much block people's view that they would normally have across the space. So it'll direct, I think, the viewer's vision even uh, more up to the skylights above and to the legs of the bugs sort of flailing above. Because it's uh, an existing work that I have shown before and I'm bringing here is to thinking, you know, how, just how it can be positioned, you know, to affect that, that movement. I had to reread Kafka when I started doing this bug, and what was so uh, interesting for me was was how he describes, um, or he he elicits this experience through the most mundane kinds of um, uh, of details, of sort of domestic details of you know. So this this man who's been turned into a bug he has to deal with you know the bed sheets that are slipping off of his slippery abdomen and. Um, you know how he eats and and uh, is able to clean himself or is unable to and 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 just how you know the domestic situation just deteriorates because he's a bug but but it's just those those um, those really mundane details about his father is still has the same attitude towards him which isn't very nice and his his sister's trying to protect him and so his family system is continuing around him even though he's a bug so I like that contrast between this really extraordinary experience uh, uh, occurrence and the, the silly mundane um, 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 facts keep going on around him and um, 
And I think there's a similar tension in, in, in the, what I try to do in my work by, you know, I, I, I'm using a medium that, that everybody can relate to. We, we know it from childhood and from um, amusement parks and fairs and, uh, um, you know, fast food restaurants and all of them, they, you know, they use these, these inflatables as, as um, um, attention grabbers and they're usually very, um, well, mundane. I mean, they, they're, they're not very descriptive uh, in a sculptural sense or a drawing sense. They're, they're really simple and, um, um, and so while I'm using that medium, I'm also trying to, a very mundane medium, I'm trying to, um, um, to add, to, to, to bring something extraordinary to it. So I, I think there's a, there's a kind of tension there that I kind of see in, the, in, in Kafka's story as well. The other aspect of transformation that um, a dung beetle implies, or that beetles generally imply, is that they're like nature's recyclers, natural recyclers, and you know, they forage on the forest floor and they tend to eat dead things and recycle them back into into earth. And uh, of course, the dung beetle you know takes that to extremes by you know using um, you know laying their eggs in a piece of camel dung and then rolling it around with them. <laughs> so. Anyway, it's a, I think it's an interesting um, association for a beetle. This dung beetle is made from um, billboards that have been taken down and are no longer used, so it's vinyl from, from uh, advertising billboards. I think they were mostly movie billboards and um, exhibition billboards for the Royal Ontario Museum uh, that I found at a, the, the company that takes the billboards down and discards them. So they would have ended up in a landfill. So I have chose ones that had a lot of black on them and I cut that, cut the pieces out of that. And so I've recycled um, material to make the work. And I guess I'm always interested in um, transforming the spaces permanently in people's minds so that they'll, they will never see it again the same way. They'll always go, oh, I remember when that piece was here. And they also then hopefully have seen uh, much more thoroughly a space that they're familiar with. It's like when you have the happy memories of a home or something that you've lived in, you've had good celebrations and birthday parties and that sort of thing and parties and, and uh, you'll remember that space relative to those things. So I think in, in, in this case as well, people might have a transformative experience of that rotunda and of City Hall because of the work. I think we're always in a, in, in a process of transformation. I think if we stop transforming, we, we're dying, but even that's a kind of transformation. So I, I just think transformation is just part of life. Uh, it's simply the process of, of living, of being alive, because we're always moving towards some other state and, uh, and we're always uh, changing.